Hello and welcome to the DIY Investing YouTube channel. We're working through every company in the S&P 500 and today is Cadence Design Systems, ticker CDNS. Over the next few minutes, I'll discuss my thoughts on both the valuation of this company and its business quality. So we'll dive on in. This company is in the software industry. If we open up its business description, we can see that they provide software, hardware services, usable IC design blocks worldwide, functional verification system, emulation, prototyping hardware. So building some hardware and some services, software, they have um, functional verification, Jasper Gold, formal verification form. Um, I don't understand what this does. Um, Works basically in the methodology, education, hosted design solutions, technical support, maintenance service, but basically software across a variety of different industries based in the U.S. Gives us a little bit of background. Now, return on invested capital, it looks like there's very wide variability here, so it's kind of hard to make sense of, but we have one loss in 2003, two, three losses. They lost money during the financial crisis and they've been profitable since. So three loss, three years of losses in the last 20 years, which is a little high. I like that number to be one or zero ideally. Um, so three is higher than I'd like. And it looks like they got punished a ton in the recession. So that's worth noting that they really struggled during recessions, 2008, 2009 being the last major recession that we had. They also lost money at the bottom of 2003 with recession. Um, they had very low return on invested capital, a single digit in those early 2000 periods. But coming out of the Great Recession, it seems like they've had pretty strong return on invested capital. So from 2010, you're at 18%, 8% in 2011, then you go 11%, 9%. So kind of okay numbers in 2013, 2014. But since 2015, you've been double digits, 13, 12, 12, 20. 46, 21, and 22. All those numbers are really attractive um, for investors. So if you look at just the last 10 years, we really like what we see here in return invested capital, double digits, but there has been some concerns in the past. So you'd want to kind of understand before investing in this company, is this going to sustain in the future? Because this recent history looks really, really good. And when we go to these 10-year median returns, that's what you see. Return on invested capital, 16.8%. Return on equity, 24%. All these numbers meet the hurdles that I'm looking for. I want this number to be at least 10%, want return on equity to be at least 15%. All these numbers very, very strong. Now, PE of 56 is, is highly concerning. Price to sales of 13, all of this suggests very extreme overvaluation. Um, I'm never going to pay more than 10 times sales for a company. I think that's just too extreme. So that would put you at a minimum of 30% overvalued of something I would consider. This is two to three times what I would consider. Most companies like to buy in the PE of 15 or less. You can justify PEs up to like 20 for really high quality companies. But this is an earnings yield of less than 2%. So you're going to get 2% of your return from current performance and you're going to get all the rest of your return from future growth minus any multiple compression that happens in the future so that's really concerning now why is valuation so high why is it overvalued it's probably because these 10-year kagers you see 10-year revenue growth of 10 percent asset growth of 9.6 percent i like that these assets are growing less than revenue and i love to see that this free cash flow is growing at 17 percent and eps is growing at 25 percent anytime you can sustain eps growth of 25 percent over a decade that's amazing it can lead to very very strong returns um over the course of time. However, it's it's kind of interesting because something's weird here with what I'm seeing. These numbers aren't um, reliable. I mean, you go from $1.57 in EPS down to 56 cents, 52 cents, 81 cents, 70 cents, 73 cents. So for five straight years, you're below your prior peak here in 2012 of earnings. That's a little concerning, um, but maybe there's something temporary there. But even then, you do decline from 2013 to 2014. So even if 2013 was a fluke, you have a decline in earnings despite growing your revenue. So that's very strange to see. Um, for a company to have that number work out that way. You're also, even though you increase earnings in 2015, you're declining in 2016. This lack of stability, that lack of stable growth is a concern. So something's really strange though, because we're seeing EPS of 25%, but that is not what you would get when you go from $1.57 per share to $2.50 per share. So $2.50 per share against this 153 is where you get that 
huge, massive overvaluation. I mean, with these numbers, it's not like you can say, oh, you're below a major peak. Even at peak earnings of a $3.53, you're still a 50 times earnings. You're still 40 times earnings. So this company is extremely, extremely highly valued. You can see revenue here is basically $3 billion and it's valued at $42 billion. That's where you're getting this 13 price to sale. So it's not like there's a lot of margin here. I mean, and on, it's not like they have high operating margins either. You have $780 million in operating profit. There's not a lot of room for those to grow. Yes, you have high gross margins. You're at $2.6 billion. But there's a huge expense here somewhere on the um, SG&A line that's really taking that up. So um, if you're enjoying this video so far, please hit that like button and don't forget to subscribe for more great videos. I'm uploading videos every single week on investing, covering individual stocks, working through every company in S&P 500, and your subscription will allow you to get those future videos. So let's dive into the income statement. You can see very low cost of goods sold. That's pretty normal for the software industry, but you can see that they're growing their SG&A pretty highly. They're growing the research and development in highly. Now, research and development for a lot of these companies is engineers. They're having to pay their engineers a lot of money to keep up. So yes, they've grown their operating profit 4X over this period of time to 893 million, but this is a $42 billion company. You're, you can't pay that much of their performance here um, without understanding that. I mean, basically cost goods sold for a sales you know, software product is the engineers that you're spending to do that. And there's just no control on this engineering spending. It just keeps growing, growing much faster than inflation. I mean, look at this, 30% growth, 20% or you know, 15% growth, it slows down a little bit to 5% growth here, and then 20%. So you're massively increasing that R&D budget over time. And this R&D budget is growing faster than your revenue. I mean, you're not hitting 20% growth rates or 10%, you know, you have 10% growth rates on the revenue line, but you're run, often running higher than 10% growth rates on your R&D line. And so that's allowing you not to get as much operating leverage as you'd like to see on this business. Um, in addition, you can see that they do dilute over time. Um, they've had some buybacks recently. It looks like they diluted for a few years and then they bought back stock for a few years. Um, not really stable in that respect. So investments, really low. PP&E, really low. Um, you have some goodwill increase, some really small acquisitions, it looks like, and some intangible assets. But basically, they're earning very strong returns on their assets. That's not the problem. They're running very strong returns on, let's see what cash flow. That's what I thought. You also have big stock-based compensation. So not only are you paying them a lot of cash in research and development expense, you're also paying a lot of research, a uh, stock-based compensation. So your stock-based compensation has 4 x over the last 10 years. That's more than your earnings per share has increased. And so it's, it's really concerning. Now you do have some buybacks here trying to offset that and it's worked in recent years. So as long as they're able to do that, they can prevent further dilution. But all that's doing is putting this money that is being spent on stock-based compensation into the bottom line. For instance, they say that they spent $643 million on buybacks and they only had $200 million of stock-based compensation. But I believe if we go back to the income statement, the shares outstanding didn't change. So where did the extra $400 million go? All that $400 million basically wipes out the net income. And so if you were to look at this on an adjusted basis, this company is basically being run for the employees and not for shareholders. This business is really good. You don't get these types of returns on invested capital and this type of growth unless the business is really, really good. But it's not being managed in a shareholder friendly way because they're having to pay their engineers simply so much of the business in order to justify it. So for me, it would be a pass primarily because of price. I mean, if you, if you cut the price by 75%, you put this at a 14 PE, then maybe I get interested despite these numbers, but I don't like seeing that much of the capital being spent on the employees as a shareholder because you don't have bargaining power. That's what it's suggesting. Maybe you have bargaining power on the price of your product to your customers. That's why you have this high gross margin, but you're not having bargaining power with your employees. And so you are getting some operating leverage here that is showing up, but I just have concerns about the ability to monetize that in a way that allows you to make a high return as a shareholder. 
you enjoyed this video, please hit that like button. It's your likes on this video that helped me to grow the show. So if you like what I'm doing, if you want it to have a bigger audience, you need to hit that like button. If you enjoy these videos and you want to see more, don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell so you can get new videos notified to your inbox when I upload them. Thank you for listening. And until next time, stop paying fees, start building wealth.